Hello and welcome to As It Comes, live from a musician's point of view. I'm Davina, I'm a freelance cellist based in London, and I don't have a lot to say today. I've been sitting here for half an hour trying to come up with something insightful to say, and I'm sure this is an experience that anyone creative can share. Writer's block, or practice block. So, instead of trying to come up with something in a rush that'll be misinformed and, quite frankly, a bit crap anyway... I'm just going to be honest. Sometimes the words do not flow. Sometimes the music doesn't go. That rhymes. So I'm not going to beat myself up about it. And if you're experiencing something similar at the moment, you shouldn't either. Maybe this is a sign we need to go outside and do something else. But I suppose that's just part of the creative process though, isn't it? And I have to trust that inspiration will strike me at a better time. It's just a shame that it's chosen not to strike me just before the release of a podcast episode. We talk a little bit about this in the following chat. My guest this episode is baritone Peter Brathwaite. Peter and I met doing some work together at Radio 3 last year, so it was lovely to catch up with him and hear about how his career involves not only singing, but writing, broadcasting, and most recently, recreating black portraiture through the Getty Challenge. Have a listen to my chat with Peter. Peter Brathwaite, thank you so much for joining me today on the podcast remotely. You're in Manchester, is that right? I'm not. I'm in Bedford at the moment. Oh, are you? Yeah, that's where I live. Uh, I'm from Manchester, though, and recently come from there, escaped just after the lockdown measures that were <laughs> introduced on Thursday. So. Oh, okay. Oh, we, yeah, lucky escape. Because I was going to ask yes. you how you were faring with second lockdown, but I, I suppose in Bedford, you're far from that. Yeah, yeah, it, it's fine here. But um, yeah, still keeping a, a low profile and staying behind closed doors. and um, But able to get off into the countryside, which is great. Um, we've discovered um, a whole patch of countryside about seven minutes away from the house. So there are now woodland walks and various other countryside activities built into the day, which makes it a lot more bearable and nice to be out in open space as well. Yeah, I think that's the thing about Bedford, isn't it? Because I notice increasingly more and more musicians are moving there mm. from London, especially, but I yes. suppose from Manchester too, because it sort of sets you up for being right in the middle of the country, doesn't it? Definitely. Yeah, the, the train takes around 40 minutes, the fastest train from Bedford to, to London. And yeah, you can be in, in Covent Garden in, in central London within pretty much the same time as you'd commute from yeah, some of the London suburbs as well. So yeah, it's really convenient. That's amazing. Yeah. I mean, not that I have to travel anywhere anymore. I recently, <laughs> moved, well, just before lockdown, I moved into a flat and I was celebrating the fact that we've got quite a good location because it's five minute yeah. walk from the train station and we've got oh, nice. three lines going through it and we can get to London Bridge in 12 minutes. But of course that's <laughs> obsolete now. Like when am I doing yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah that's the thing living in Bedford and during lockdown it's felt like yeah no reason to go into London so it feels very separate to my working life in London and and all the things that I'm used to doing there as well so mm. yeah it's been adjusting to that new state of being as well yeah I mean I was gonna ask I mean because you're a very very busy musician you know you do loads of things you've been working with Royal Opera House and how did you feel with all the cancellations, you know, being used to traveling around the place for your work and then being mm. confined to one place and keeping busy? Yeah, it's, it's been pretty tough because you're so used to just always being in motion as a musician. There's always a, a coaching to go to or a lesson or rehearsals and then performances so you just expect this to happen and then when it stops it's a case of you know working out you know, what to do with your life because you, you can't build your life around just practicing and um, you have to get out and see things and and so much of the lived experience informs music making and if, if you have very little of that experience and uh, you're not leaving the house then yeah making music and being creative becomes much more difficult yeah so yeah it was quite an abrupt stop to things and I was hoping that 
some things would remain in the diary for this year, but unfortunately, all of it disappeared and was either cancelled or postponed. So, how do you feel about what's coming up, or I guess not coming up in the future? It's just placing all my hopes in next year and yeah, the possibility of being in a rehearsal room again and performing with colleagues and making music in the way that we're used to and things resuming in probably not an, uh, an ordinary way, but yeah, a way that we can move forwards and uh, start to create again. Uh, mm-hmm. So that that's what's driving me at the moment. And uh, and in the meantime, trying to find other projects that can fill the time and yeah, allow me not to dwell on the situation because it, yeah, it's it's quite hard and I haven't seen many of my colleagues and those that I have seen, uh, we, we've done distance walks um, in the park. Yeah, we, we share the same experience of that loss and, and grieving the the work that we've lost and the enjoyment we get from working together as well. So mm. yeah, it's good to find other things to keep the mind occupied. <laughs> Of course, there's something that you do that keeps you busy during lockdown, which we'll talk about in a minute. But it is, yeah, as you say, really, really important to keep busy because I I guess it keeps you looking forward, doesn't Mm, it? Yeah, of course. Yeah, we we have to believe that there will be a time when things will improve and, yeah, we can get back to doing what we, we love. So, yeah. One thing that I do notice in my peer group, and you see it a lot with people who are, as you you mentioned the word mourning, they mourn the loss of of Mm. what we had. But then I think sometimes there's that danger of those people being a bit reluctant to move forward and not finding other things to do and and thinking, oh, things will never be the same as what it was before. And But like, how can you sort of help them see that there is hope or give them that hope? Yeah, it's it's tricky because although... A lot of us are mourning what we had before. I think we're realizing that we can do things differently <laughs> and, um, and we have to adapt. And, and that's the thing with our training and our experience. We're so used to these routines and ways of doing things that it can be quite a shock to the system when those things are unsettled. And you know, it's a case of working out what opportunities can come out of this time and what we can learn from this period and I was thinking only this morning about recording myself singing uh, videos and and that's something that I'm not really comfortable with uh, that one the technology the, the idea of probably me in the music room doing hundreds of edits trying to get the one that I, I think sounds the, <laughs> the best and although there are some classical musicians who are Uh, well-versed in that and able to do that I think that's something that uh, we will have to learn in the future and and become more comfortable with because obviously that's how we're having to put forth our music these days is Mm. you know online recording or live streaming in some cases and getting your head around the technology can be really really difficult especially if you've never done it before but I think actually it's a really useful thing to do because I think we've all had teachers that have told us things like you know you should record yourself yes (laughs) you know you do it maybe once to say that you've done it well in my case but then you know now like in a short amount of time I mean I say short it's been like four months but having to record myself and having to listen back it's been a good way for me Mm. to actually monitor the way I do sound you know and having that luxury of time to listen to myself when otherwise I'd just be frantically prepping for the next gig or the performance or something yeah of course so so have you done any live streams oh my gosh (laughs) (laughs) I did one live stream it was a few weeks ago and it's very strange it's quite unsettling because you don't have yeah. the audience, you know, you don't have the atmosphere of the audience, you don't have them reacting, and you just no. hope that people are watching. You can see people are because they're reacting with a thumbs up, you know, hopefully a <laughs> yeah. thumbs up, not the angry face. <laughs> it's very strange. And the first two and a half minutes of it was me standing in front of the computer, just going like, is it on? Like, <laughs> Yeah. And then I did another recital, which was pre-recorded. Mm. That was quite strange in itself because we recorded it and then we sent it off and then it was broadcast at a live date. And we wanted right. to watch it at the time. And then at six o'clock when it went out, 
And then at 5.58, I experienced something very curious, which I've never experienced before. And that was feeling nervous for a performance that I've already done. Yeah, so the, the sort of disembodied experience. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. And it's like, well, I can't do anything about this performance. But usually you no. have that feeling before a performance and it helps your adrenaline and it sort of drives you to want to do your best. But you can't do it if you've already done it. <laughs> No, it's done. Yeah. Love you too. <laughs> have you experienced the wonder that is live streaming? I haven't. I've done some stuff for the Manchester Jewish Museum that was pre-recorded and then multi-tracked along with other voices, a community ensemble. And the project was to respond to uh, parts of their archives, so stories of migrants and people who had come to Manchester in the 40s and 50s onwards and so yeah as well that was broadcast on a later date so I kind of detached myself from it because of, of course you feel nervous because you know that the time is coming up and and what you've created is going to be revealed so there was that and yeah nothing really performance that, that's been live streamed or anything uh, uh, performance I did at the Royal Opera House at Christmas was put on the, their learning platform because um, it was a family show. And that was quite exciting seeing that come online after a few months. And yeah, it's having the courage actually to to think, oh, right, maybe I should start doing the odd recital from <laughs> home. And yeah, how does that feel? What does that involve? Yeah. And would it be fun? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Would I enjoy the experience? Yeah. <laughs> I know that's, that's a major factor. But I suppose it's like with any online content that you put out there, there is just that risk factor, isn't there? Like putting yourself yes, yeah, that's out the there thing. and it's like, oh, is this going to get a good reception? And it's just not really knowing. And then it being out of your control no. once it's... Yes, that's out. the thing. And we have so much control in the, the concert hall and we have numerous chances to redeem ourselves with the, the next piece or the next bar or the, the next moment or the, the smile to the, the audience that hopefully will mean that they forgive you for something that you've done but actually the scrutiny that's there with something that you present as a video thing package uh, yeah it feels so much more like vulnerable <laughs> isn't it you know yeah if you don't hold their attention the audience could just close their browser turn you off shut you down <laughs> i don't know Ho hopefully you don't get that so much in concert halls <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah <laughs> so we were talking a little bit about adaptability and you know adapting with the times and everything yeah. and that just brings to mm. mind versatility and you are one of the most versatile musicians I know, but in being very, very versatile, you know, you're not only an opera singer where you have to embody different roles and different characters, but you're also a writer, broadcaster. I know you mostly from the speech contribution work that we did through Radio 3 last year. Yeah, we worked yeah, together. Fun times. <laughs> we, were, we were fellow time travellers. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Tell me about your approach to versatility and how that informs you as a musician, but also your life as well. I think I've always wanted to have a few things going at the same time. I've always found it difficult to make decisions about doing one thing this started at school when I was trying to choose subjects and then when it came to applying to university I, I couldn't decide then so I, I specifically chose a course where I could study three subjects at the same time because I wanted to keep things going and and have that variety and varied experience and meet new people and at the same time and that has been something that stayed with me uh, throughout my singing training and then entering the profession and wanting to have different creative outlets and whether that's painting and drawing something that I, I studied at university but I, I don't do that much now but it's still a, a big part of my life in terms of going to galleries and absorbing visual art and I find that's really helpful for when I'm preparing a role, for instance, um, because I, I'm looking at, at character, I'm looking at composition and how things are put together and how you pull things apart to understand them. And it's the, the same thought process as getting a score and looking at a character and thinking, mm, what are the other characters saying about 
that person and why does he say that or why has the composer chosen to set this specific scene at this tempo or in this way and why is the legato line like that and then with the writing it was something that I fell into because I wanted to create my own work, my own project, uh, which was a type of recital that was my degenerate music project, which is based on music that was banned by the Nazis. So it's a, a wide range of composers, primarily Jewish composers, all types of music. So cabaret and jazz opera and atonal compositions. I got really excited about this period of creativity that in the Weimar Republic and decided that I'd create a performance based on this uh, with uh, readings of Nazi propaganda and music and visual art as well. I worked with a digital artist uh, who created a film that ran behind the performance as well. And when I was putting it together, I uh, was in touch with the Guardian and I told them about the, the project and they said, would you like to write about it? I was like, no, of course not. <laughs> <laughs> you can do that, surely. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and that was my, the first big experience of writing. And I, I'd written a few blog posts when I was a student about living in, in Europe because I was studied in, in Belgium for a year. And that was like, uh, places to eat when you're auditioning in the Netherlands or yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, what, what trains are like and, and things like that. But yeah, actually having to sit down and write about my own project and my own work was really tricky. And it made me actually refine my thinking about the project and, and what it was I was trying to present and what I wanted to achieve by doing it. You have to really like clarify in your own brain what it is yes. you want to communicate yeah. because the best writing comes from, you know, if you really believe what it is that you're trying to say. Of course. I, I found that really helpful for then going into the performance and speaking to the audience about why I was presenting this music and what I hoped they'd take away from it and, um, and why it was important for me to put this performance on and, because I, I believe that many of these composers were the lead cultural envoys of, of their day. And um, they speak to us now in a, a really fresh, vibrant way, as, as fresh as they, they did in the, the 1920s and 30s. Mm. And yeah, writing has been a way to clarify m my own thought and articulate the questions I, I want to ask through my, my singing and my music. And then... Yeah, of course, we met doing the BBC Next Generation Voices. And applying for that scheme was having had the experience of writing and, and wanting to yeah, expand on that and tell stories in a different way. And it, it's all about telling stories, really. And, and that's what we do in, yeah, in music. Communicate, and, yeah. Yeah, that felt like another, an, another natural stepping stone, a, a progression into another sphere that uh, I really didn't have that much experience mm -hmm. of, but um, has been hugely rewarding. And, uh, and especially with the time travellers that we were doing at the time, um, finding very <laughs> obscure <laughs> bits of music exactly history. Exactly, sifting through <laughs> like, the internet, trying to find something that no one's ever spoken about before, something really, <laughs> yeah. really original, and then having to write you know, a good 250 words on it and make it really effective, which, I mean, I yes, personally found um, that quite challenging, the writing, sitting down to write something and yeah. when you're trying to find out about it as well in a limited time span. Of course, because it, it's finding out about it and then streamlining it and making it entertaining as well, because you have to grab people's attention in such, such a short space of time. And, and again, the real refining of thought and clarity of thought in when you only have 250 words and and your session is next week <laughs> yes you're like oh no what am i <laughs> yeah i mean because that's the thing it's sort of it's easy to clarify and refine your thoughts on something to make it something that you really believe mm. in if you have the luxury of time which is why in a way lockdown is a really a nice thing to do to ha have a 
creative project mm. where you can just sort of dwell on your thoughts. But working towards a deadline sometimes, sometimes it's very necessary, yes. but sometimes it can be quite mm. daunting because the pace is different from how you, perhaps your creative pace would be. Yeah, and, it, and it's often the case where I know we experience this with with music and music we've learned and performed and you come back to it a, a few years later or a few months later and something feels easier or you suddenly have this moment where the, the light switch um, is yeah. turned on and everything becomes clear and and that's the same with with writing in a way and sometimes you you can't work out how to say something but give it a bit more time and you think oh right well i can say it like this and this works yeah. and, uh, but yeah, of course, we don't always have the luxury. <laughs> for me, for writing, the main thing I have to remind myself to do is just to get something on the page because yes, I, yeah. often I'm just caught up in my own thoughts and and mm. it's just really, really overwhelming. And I just think, oh, where on earth do I start? But then I have to remind myself, well, just start, <laughs> you know. And then as, yes, as long yeah. as you've got something on the page, and for me, I'm quite visual the way I, I work, as long as I've got the words on the page, then at least it's something to go from rather than abstract yeah, and you can form. then start to sort of take things away and put things in and shuffle things yeah. around and, i mean i yeah. think it's it's really admirable uh, you know just uh, talking to you about versatility and having variety in your work because i'm a firm believer in everything you do in life informs everything else you do and it shapes your your world view and it's just really interesting that if you look closely enough or sometimes you don't even need to look that closely but you can always find parallels mm. between you know one discipline and another like writing or speaking with music and, and singing it's yeah it's all connected i think before i used to sometimes feel guilty if i wasn't doing just singing and but cutting myself some slack and realizing that actually yeah this work will inform my singing and vice versa it, it all sort of works in in quite a, a beautiful way and I, I remember there's a, a Lee and Tim Price interview on on YouTube where she talks about how she would prepare for roles and the research she does and it's all about the literature she reads around the character mm -hmm. and uh, the gallery she's been visiting and yeah. the people she's met and and all of these things go together to create her uh, on stage personas and, and characters and I really believe that the different uh, disciplines can support and, and uplift um, the music as they well. give everything context don't they mm. I mean yeah. I think you know it's just quite important for people maybe in music colleges these days and you know you mentioned before feeling guilty if you weren't singing I think yeah every musician can relate to that feeling of practice guilt. It's like, I should be practicing. I should be mm. practicing. But what are you practicing for? If you've got nothing to say, you haven't yeah. got any life yes. experiences that you're trying to communicate. And I think it's, it's important for students to remember, you know, have a life as well. Life is not just the practice room. Is it? <laughs> yeah. No, no, not at all. Yeah. I think that's something to come out of this time as well, because with, limited performance opportunities or none <laughs> then yeah you you have to confront life in all its ugliness and and beauty as well and yeah you realize that the singing or or music uh, as a musician is a, a big part of life but it, it's not the whole of, of uh, life yeah, yeah using the lockdown to you know, maybe uncover other talents that you might have or other or pursue other in yeah. interests. And speaking yeah. of, so you've been keeping very busy during lockdown and <laughs> we can't not mention your Getty challenge work that you've been doing <laughs> throughout the pandemic. So on Instagram, you've been doing really incredible, intricate recreations of famous or well, sometimes not so famous portraits, but most pertinently recreating black portraiture so uh, tell us a bit about your journey into doing this so this has been going now for well when did i start i think it was good friday i posted the first image and i i'd seen other people doing it and yeah didn't see many black faces represented uh, through the paintings that had been chosen by others 
And I thought it was a, a really brilliant challenge set by the Getty Museum to recreate art with only what you have around you in your, in your home. Uh, so I was flicking through some books and looking on websites and I knew a, a very small number of paintings that include black sitters. And I, I found one that I, I'd seen somewhere before. I thought it was quite funny because it was a, a young boy with a, a wine glass and a little puppy on a, on a pillow next to him. And uh, I thought, well, this is a, a good one to do because I can position myself in, in the bay window and I have a table like that. And uh, we've got this sheep that goes in the microwave and keeps you warm. Okay, night. so not a real puppy, <laughs> but a sheep. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, yeah. So I, I did that first one and. I think people found it amusing and I just put in black portraiture and rediscovering black portraiture through the Getty Museum and Challenge. And having done that one, I realized that actually, yeah, maybe this is something worth pursuing and exploring for myself because I'm seeing here through using a search engine that I'm finding other paintings that I, I wasn't aware of, and I'm sure many other people aren't aware of them. Uh, so why not do a, a, a little collection of these? And at the time, I didn't really expect to be um, <laughs> approaching 80. Yeah. <laughs> but oh, yeah. um, It's absolutely incredible. Because Do you do one almost every day or every few days? At the start, I was doing one every single day. So the first 50, it was one every day. Um, and then after that, it became every other day. And then it moved to Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And now we're moving to either one or two mm -hmm. a week. Because uh, <laughs> it's become a, a, a huge part of my, my life. I mean, it's like you've gotten a lot of press out of it and it's, it's kind of exploded. It, must also be quite time consuming as well, right? Because I mean, every, I feel like everything you see on Instagram, there's always hours and hours and hours of work behind a lot of what you see yeah. that you don't necessarily think about. Like how long does it take to set up each portrait? Because some of them are quite intricate. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it varies really. Sometimes I'll see a painting and I'll think, I know exactly how to recreate this. So then it's a case of just, curating the objects so bringing them together um, from around the house and various parts of the house and putting them all in one place and then working out the positioning and where I should set, set myself up and then I'll call my partner and say I'm ready take the photo <laughs> and, and he, yeah <laughs> so yeah when it works like that it's great but other times it can be much longer and uh, for instance the, the one that I, I'd like to do this week is taking a bit of time to think up how to replace certain items of clothing and objects in the original image. I can be mulling things over for a week or so or longer um, before I actually work out how to, to stage the mm. image in a way that says something and comments on the original but also reflects on, on what it means now and and how it fits into the world today yeah. so yeah that can become time consuming and and also there's been an added element of actually curating the series over time so there have been themes that have cropped up over time merely because i've discovered something that i didn't realize was there before whether that's Haitian revolutionaries or women entertainers or enslaved women. And yeah, so the, there are these areas that I've been trying to uh, shed light on and, and platform. And sometimes you, you see how you fall into patterns naturally without actually setting out to do a theme. It, it's quite interesting. And also that bleeds into then the things that you end up using for the recreations. Yeah. I was going to ask you, I mean, because you started doing this in peak lockdown where, you know, you can't just pop down to the shops and buy something. So how, 
uh, I mean, you had to be quite creative with finding things around mm. the house, I suppose. Lucky that I'm a bit of a hoarder, so. <laughs> Lucky I had loads of stuff. <laughs> There's junk everywhere. Um, and, um, perfect. You're perfectly set out to do this project. Yeah. It's excellent. So I, I'm yeah, vindicated that uh, yeah, the years of keeping and not throwing anything away <laughs> finally paid off and I'm able to use these things. But more specifically, I, I've been trying to use items that, mean something to me and some of these items have been family heirlooms one is a, a patchwork quilt that was put together by my grandmother and the other is a cooking implement called a cuckoo stick which is shaped a bit like a, a cricket bat it's used to stir the national dish of barbados um Oh, yeah. And cool. yeah. i think i saw did you use that one in the portrait of joseph Boulogne? i think i did yes because he's he he usually holds a sword. yes yeah i i did use it there and yeah, yeah. so for anyone who doesn't know joseph Boulogne, <laughs> composer in the chevalier saint georges yes saint georges yes. <laughs> yeah but yeah there's that quite famous portrait of him yes the sword and then you have your cuckoo stick. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there was one that made me laugh a few days ago and the original portrait the subject is holding a pineapple mm. But in lieu of a pineapple, you used a can of pineapple slices. Yes, yeah. And, and I just <laughs> yeah. made my um, second pineapple upside down cake. So it, 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 oh, it nice. just worked out very well. Then. <laughs> I have something to show you here that will make you laugh, actually. I recently, because I'm a little bit obsessed with going to home base, so <gasps> cutting up my yes. flat. <laughs> but check out this house plant that I bought. Oh, wow. It's actually a little pineapple that plant. It's very so, impressive. So for people who can't see this, i.e. all the listeners, it's a houseplant and at the very top of it is sprouting a tiny little pineapple. That's so exciting. <laughs> and do you th is it edible or just ornamental? Well, at the moment it's ornamental. I'm not sure if it will grow you... any bigger because if it grows any bigger, it will probably fall over. You need to give it some fertilizer and manure and all sorts to... <laughs> yeah. I gave it some plant food yesterday, so hopefully it just like... Could, could, could you imagine if I just grew pineapples in the UK? I know. Like, I, <laughs> such an anomaly. <laughs> I went to Dominica about three years ago, and that was the thing that I was most astounded by. It was, it was just walking up the road, um, and on the roadside, there were pineapples just sprouting up out of the the tarmac and it, it was God, just naturally. Yeah. That's you saw them in their like in their natural habitat yeah. uh, i spent about 15 minutes taking photographs of this one pineapple <laughs> <laughs> oh man you should have taken one home yeah. and made a feature in your, in your portraits it's really nice to see you use the household objects in really creative ways, you know, like an ironing board or yeah. like the microwave sheep in lieu of a dog. Although sad that you don't have a puppy. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Maybe one day. <laughs> so in my podcast, I have a segment called the wild card question round, which sure. is where you have the opportunity to choose what I ask you next based on three topics that I okay. present you. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. So the topics are gardening. Okay. Cooking. And what I'm practicing. Right. Okay. Because I know you're practicing just before this. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Let's do gardening. Oh, yeah. nice. Yeah. Great. That's the first time I've asked that question. And I think it's because recently I've become quite interested in gardening mm. during the lockdown. That's sort of yeah. one of the things that has kept me sane during this time. Yeah. Can you tell me, we've talked a little bit about houseplants already. What's your favorite houseplant and what's your Ooh. favorite outdoor plant? So I'm into succulents at the moment. <laughs> nice. Yeah. I suppose it falls into, it's like sourdough, isn't it? It's, uh, all of that. But, um, but um, yeah. Very I, trendy these days. Yeah. <laughs> partly, we, I just find them, I really like their, their sort of succulent, juicy leaves. <laughs> um, and some of them that I have are really furry. I'm, I'm not really sure what the furry ones are called, um, but mm -hmm. they're doing really well. I got them from 
uh, Lidl. Really? Lidl sell succulents? Yes, yeah. And they've lasted a really, really long time. And had to, I had to replant them recently because they've just grown yeah, far too big for the, the pots, the original pots. And they're doing really well in our utility room. And uh, we've got a, a skylight in there. So, so they get a lot of sun. Yeah, the lightest place in the house. And they, they actually absolutely love it so when i walk into the kitchen now it's just like a, a jungle with all of these furry plants leaning over and um, talking to each other and <laughs> yeah yeah i reckon plants do interact with each other yeah i don't have that many succulents i have well i have this one here i think it's called a calenco right okay. oh sorry camera this that kind of oh thing? yeah that, that's nice yeah it, it looks a bit like I've got a, a money plant and a, or a jade oh. plant and it, it, it has similar uh, shaped yeah. leaves to that. Mm. This one looks almost powdery, actually. Yeah. Um, I rescued it from a friend who was moving away right. from London. And I'm finding it a bit difficult to revive it because it, some of its leaves start mm. looking a bit saggy. And I, and I just started thinking, what do you want? Do you yeah. want water? Probably not. Do you want more sun? Should I yeah. cut those leaves off? <laughs> what do you do? Yeah, sometimes some of the succulents that I have, the leaves fall off really easily. Um, so you can <laughs> sort of breathe on them and the leaves fall off. Um, maybe yeah. that's just because I'm not looking after them properly. But I found that the ones that, when they go brown, they just fall off. And um, some of them then start to grow when they fall off. Um, so I've got plant babies um, growing around the main plant. <laughs> and oh, no. I, I love just watching them and watching them develop. And um, mm. especially during lockdown, because you, you've got time to you actually the time. see the, <laughs> <laughs> the progression of, of these plants and um, how they respond to, to the light and the food that you're giving them. And Yeah. I love a good succulent. I don't have mm. that many, though. I've got a lot of, oh, I've got my pineapple, um, yeah. <laughs> but I have a lot of, <laughs> Plants in the bathroom, so tropical plants that love nice. humidity. Yeah. And they do really well. What have you got, ferns and things? Or Yeah, so I've got a Boston yeah. fern. And nice. that's brilliant in the bathroom yeah. because it just soaks up all the steam, loves it. And apparently, supposedly air purifying. Right, yeah. So that's good. And we don't have any mold in our bathroom. No. So I think that's doing quite well. Yeah. Uh, we also have Alocasia poly, which is right. also known as elephant ear. It's got quite thick leaves. And a monstera, because every millennial needs a monstera. Yes, yeah, yeah. And in my case, I have two. <laughs> <laughs> but very easy to look after. Yeah. And, they, and they look cool with the holes in the leaves. Yeah. So tell me, what's your favourite outdoor plant then? Ooh, I love roses, actually. Nice. Very simple. Uh, we have a, a climbing rose at the far end of the garden. We inherited it when we moved into the house, and um, it's huge and it's always full of bugs so I spend a lot of time um, using bug away to um, try and clear it up but in spite of that uh, the roses are really healthy and beautiful so I'm not sure whether yeah they have this sort of contract uh, that they yeah they live together peacefully <laughs> but, they're obviously attracting wildlife into your garden which yeah it's a good thing mm. and like bugs as just sometimes really really annoying uh, especially if they're like aphids or something yeah but sometimes you get the bees and that's that's a good thing yeah yeah, yeah. and the color is is beautiful and and they they came into bloom just at the the start of lockdown so it was yeah joyful to open the door and having read the news and <laughs> escape to the garden and enjoy the roses i mean that's why mm. i feel quite grateful that we've gone into lockdown in spring going into summer yeah whereas in the southern hemisphere where i'm from in new zealand they were going into winter and obviously winter's a bit more milder there depending yeah. on where you're from but can you imagine you know going into lockdown with in gray January? skies and yeah it wouldn't be good yeah. uh, getting dark at like three o'clock yeah really <laughs> <laughs> but maybe cozy with fires and and thick socks and blankets sure yeah an extended <laughs> christmas yes yeah <laughs> everyone's at home indoors <laughs> the fairy lights are always up <laughs> <laughs> that's nice i love hearing about people's plants and i'm i'm really happy that i can talk about this kind of thing now because a year ago i had no interest at all in gardening oh really but you've been transformed i have yeah well i think it's been through moving into this new flat we have a garden so yeah 
you know, you want to make the most out of it. And then mm. also during lockdown as well, I've had the time just to enjoy growing vegetables. And oh, uh, yes. And yeah. So what, what are you growing? Oh, man. So I had very prolific courgette plants. Uh. Yeah, they fruited very early in May. I think I put a photo on social media and then everyone was like, how on earth are you getting courgettes already? <laughs> but it was, it was, I don't know. They just were amplified by the sun. <laughs> and the yeah, because we had that, that burst of hot weather, didn't we? Right at yeah. the start of, of lockdown. So yeah, maybe they are. Yeah, and everyone's like, this is not too bad. Yeah. <laughs> So courgettes, they're starting to taper off. I think that because they got started so early, they're going to die early. Mm. But the tomatoes are coming through now. And that's ah. a joy. Tomatoes and the cucumbers as well. So homemade Greek salads. Yeah. So we, and we make some um, pasta sauces and things like that. Yeah. 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 I did that yesterday, actually. It's just so cool going out into the garden, picking whatever. And yeah. Then it, becoming your lunch in like 20 minutes yeah the, there's an otolenghi <laughs> recipe of oven dried dehydrated tomatoes and it's in his book jerusalem and they're yeah. so intense that they're really delicious very sweet yeah really amplify the mm. flavor i mean like straight off the vine tastes pretty good but like yeah. you concentrate that flavor it's like oh mm. this is amazing <laughs> everyone raves about otto lengi don't they like, yeah the... yeah he's a bit of a legend with all the <laughs> recipes and salads and stuff yeah. yeah that that book in particular is, is very good and yeah so many the simplicity of the of just putting all of these spices together is yeah wonderful and you get this bouquet of of flavors and yeah i love the the rice recipes with lots of cumin and and then crispy fried onions on top it's delicious <laughs> yeah a friend of mine actually cooked me an otolenghi recipe recently mm. and she used orzo so like the rice oh, yeah. shaped pasta mm. but she toasted it right so it had a kind of nutty flavor and the crispy yeah a, outer, a little yeah, bit was, uh, yeah, yeah. You know, you think of pasta that's not cooked and it, it doesn't really taste of anything, but you fry it in a, a dry pan, I guess. I wasn't watching her. I just ate it later. <laughs> and um, yeah, and it just had, it sort of transformed the role of, of pasta. Yeah. Really. And then that was in a sort of tomato -y sauce with lots of basil and feta. Oh, it was, mm. it was great. Very yeah. simple, but yeah. very effective. Mm. Yeah. Peter, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today. No, thanks for having me. Thank you. So where can people follow you and find out more about your work? So I'm on Twitter and my handle is Peter Brathwaite. And I'm on Instagram with the handle Peter underscore Brathwaite. And then my website is peterbrathwaitebaritone.com. Said very well in a baritone voice. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I interrupted you. Go on. <laughs> yeah, you can find you can find information about singing work and what might be coming up and what might not be coming up. And, and, <laughs> and such. this is cancelled. This is cancelled. This is cancelled. Yeah. But at least you've got you know lots of different activities that are keeping you busy. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much for chatting to me. Today. No, thanks for having me. Thank you. That was Peter Brathwaite. Do check out his Instagram for his black portraiture recreations. They're amazing and you'll learn so much from them too. I'm also so impressed by how opera singers laugh. It's so resonant. Maybe they learn that at opera school or wherever they learn how to opera. This week's Music College Didn't Prepare Me comes from an anonymous contributor. Music College Didn't Prepare Me for one of my first gigs back after lockdown. I'd received a last-minute call to be in a pop music video. Naturally, I said yes, as I, like many musicians at the moment, haven't got a lot going on at the moment. <laughs> Why's that? How's this for a first gig after lockdown? It was to be filmed outdoors. Arrival time on set was 8am. I was put down to play the violin, which is not my primary instrument, as I am a violist. The location was also a good hour and a half away from where I live. It's been a good long while since I've seen that time of the morning. 
Part of the reason for the early start was that a heat wave was predicted, so the production company was hoping for cooler weather. However, sitting there outdoors in black clothing as the sun gained intensity resulted in some very sweaty moments. Also, as this was a video shoot, it meant that we weren't actually playing, but miming. Despite this, and perhaps out of keenness for actually having a gig, I'd rosined up my bow nice and good, as I do whenever I have to play, <laughs> only to sit down in the increasingly blazing sun in black clothing, miming on an instrument that I don't actually play. A few times my fingers were a good third above what the backing track was playing. Good thing no one could hear us. It was still lots of fun though, and even after lockdown during a global pandemic, there are still elements of my job that surprise me. Thank you very much. Definitely, miming is totally a thing that we don't learn at music college. A lot of work that we do as musicians is backing up pop singers and video shoots as well. So, I mean, it's enough of a struggle to play softly as there's so much emphasis at college on producing substantial and focused sound as well as projection, which implies that you want your sound to be big and you want your sound to get out there. But obviously, if you're doing a video shoot along to a pre-recorded track, you're not going to want to make a sound, and that's the challenge. Dragging your bow across a string noiselessly, as well as getting into the groove. Still, no one can comment on your intonation, so that's a plus. Remember, if you have something that Music College didn't prepare you for that you'd like shared or discussed on the podcast, then let me know. You can email me at asitcomespodcast at gmail.com. That's it for this week. Special thanks to Ros Nagy for my logo and Daniel Alms for my jingle. Huge thanks to Peter Brathwaite for joining me as my guest this episode. And as always, thank you for listening. Do get in touch at asitcomespodcast at gmail.com and remember to like and follow the podcast and assistant producer Romeo's antics on Facebook and Instagram at asitcomespod. Rate, review and subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts and thank you for spreading the word. Chat to you soon and take good care. Bye. Bye.